All right, so we were talking about this uh, very simple system with one synchronous generator. Um, and we finished we finish last class talking about two important concepts. One was the inertia, and the other was the angle delta. So what is the inertia? How we can describe that? Uh, the grid's resistance to frequency oscillations. OK, uh, what else can we say? That's very good. Oh, That's very good. Takes for the generator's been up. Yes, and a H is what? Half of the time yeah, half that. to take the machine from rest to nominal speed at nominal yeah. torque. So we gave that definition. Mathematically, is a kinetic energy stored at nominal uh, speed divided by the nominal power. That's uh, the mathematical definition. And also we describe delta. So what is delta? You said that that is called the rotor angle as well. Uh, or the loading angle. So what is delta? So the angle, from my understanding, it's the angle that separates the flux that's generated in the rotor with the flux that's induced in the windings. So the more power that needs to be transferred, the more torque that's applied will create make that angle larger. And the maximum angle in the case of uh, no losses and uh, uh, cylinder rotor is 90 degrees, right? Um, but uh, the, the loading angle or rotor angle will describe how much the machine will deviate from the nominal position. So the, the nominal position will be a specific position uh, that is obtained by uh, having a constant speed, the nominal speed of the machine. So any deviation the machine will have with respect to that nominal position will be the delta angle, right? So when we load the machine, then this angle will change and will tell us how much the machine deviates from the nominal position. So those are the two definitions. And today, what I, I'm going to do with you, I'm going to start like studying the dynamic of this synchronous generator with uh, the classical model representation connected uh, through a line to an infinite bus. Infinite bus, by definition, is a point in the system that will keep the frequency at 60 hertz and the voltage is going to remain constant. The voltage and magnitude and the angle will not change. These are given. For simplification, in everything that comes after this, we're going to assume that the angle is zero. But actually, we can have any angle here at the infinite bus. But let's assume zero for now. So uh, the machine, the dynamics in this system will be basically a related. Uh, it's going to be related to the motion of this uh, generator. So the, the uh, model also includes the electrical side of the machine that is described by this circuit. So this part is going to be the grid. Here we have the model of the line, and here we have the infinite pass with a constant voltage. But this part that is uh, uh, enclosed here by this segmental line correspond to the electrical model of the machine. So you will have a current that is going to be algebra variable, and the only state variables that we have in this circuit will have to do with the angle delta. So for now, what we need to do is how we can consider this uh, dynamic model for the machine subject to the restriction that this circuit will enforce. By looking at the circuit, then we can apply our knowledge of circuit analysis. And in this case, it's so simple. We apply the KDL. So the voltage here in this internal voltage in the machine must be equal to the voltage drop, internal voltage drop in the machine, voltage drop along the line, plus the voltage at the infinite bus. And that's the equation we have here. Instead of using polar representation here, I'm using the exponential representation, with, which is the same, E angle delta. That is the meaning of that. So for this case, which is the infinite bus, is B uh, exponential of J theta, but theta is zero. So this will be just one. So basically, here we have B angle zero. So that's the definition for the, the circuit, uh, the Kirchhoff voltage law. At the same time, we have a definition of power 
that uh, we need the power, the electrical power that will come out of this generator because that will define the accelerating power in the machine and, and define how the motion of this machine will be. So we need an expression for the active power that come out of that generator. So by definition, that is the real part of this voltage multiplied by this current pointing it. This is a complex power that come out of the source, but we're, we are interested in the real part because that's the electrical active power coming out of the machine. So we can combine these two equations. From this equation, we can obtain an expression for the current. We solve for the current from this expression. We replace it here, and then we get the real part. Why I'm explaining this, uh, and probably you have seen this equation before, because then we're not going to have just one generator. We're going to have multiple generators. We're not going to have a line, an infinite path. We may have any other configuration. So the steps that I am describing now will be uh, also applicable to any other system. So we obtain an expression for the current, and that expression in this case will depend on the voltage at the infinite bus, and in general will depend on the variables of the grid, basically voltage at the bus, and will depend in this case on the state variable, delta. So in general, this expression for current will depend on both variables from the grid and also the state variables related to the machine. So using that definition for covering, we replace that here. We need to use the covering conjugate. So here's the covering, and we need to get the conjugate of this. So the conjugate of the exponential J delta is exponential of negative J delta. And the, and the conjugate of uh, this part in the denominator is going to be negative J, uh, the the, the synchronous reactance plus the reactance of the line. So that's what we have uh, right here in this both part. So if we multiply this term by the first term that you have here, you have E exponential of J delta multiplied by E exponential of negative J delta. And on this other side, you have E exponential of J delta times voltage B. So as you can see here, this term gets canceled. You just have E squared. One over negative J is J. So one over negative J is just J. And here you, we can put the, the angle of that, on that side. As you can see, this is purely imaginary. We have that term. But this, we don't know yet because the exponential of J delta is cosine of delta plus J sine of delta. So if we use cosine of delta and multiply by that, we will obtain the second term. If we use plus J sine of delta multiply by that, you have negative J squared, which is plus one. And that's the second term that involves sine of delta. If we need to take the real part of this, these are purely imaginary. This is actually the expression we will get for the electrical power that come out of that generator. As we can see here, this is a sinusoidal function, and this is the amplitude that we will have for that electrical power. We can call it P max. So the maximum power possible we can get out of that generator will depend on your internal voltage in the machine, voltage of the infinite path. And of course, the reactances of the generator and the line. If these reactances are smaller, then P max will be higher. If the internal voltage, if we increase the carbon in the field in the generator, E will be larger, then P max will be larger as well. So that's expression for the electrical power. Now, if we put everything together, that's going to be the model that we have for the generator. So these two equations will describe the motion of the machine. This is what we reviewed last class. The changes in the angle will depend on the difference of the 
rotation and the speeding per unit with respect to one. The reason why we have one here is because this system has an infinite path that will keep the frequency at one per unit in the system. The machine can change the speed and oscillate, but will oscillate around one. And this is the equation that defines the changes in the speed. And this has to do with the power imbalance. So the power that comes from the turbine must be equal to the power, electrical power we take from the generator and in, in injecting that power to the grid. If these are different, then the machine will either speed up or slow down and change the speed uh, from the nominal speed of one per unit. And because we have the grid, this is the last equation we're adding, we add this electrical equation. Uh, now, the electrical power depends on that function. So we can add this uh, algebraic equation. On this side of the equation, you have zero that defines that this equation has no dynamic. That means that PE can change instantaneously depending on the changes you may have on delta. So far, so good. Are you following me? This one, because the infinite bus by definition will keep the frequency in the system at 60 hertz. So you will have a single generator here connected through that line to the infinite bus. If there is any disturbance in that generator, the generator will oscillate with respect to that infinite bus. It will be different if the system would be finite and you have actually two machines and with finite inertia, not infinite inertia. Then in that case, the dynamics of the system will depend on the difference of the two machines. Later, we can consider that example, what, what would be different if we have a finite system. This is called infinite bus because actually we're assuming that the inertia of that equivalent generator is infinite. We will not let the frequency deviate from 60 hertz. Okay, so in this case, it's so simple because the system is just a machine line and infinite bus. Actually, we can replace this expression for PE and put it just there. And in that case, instead of dealing with a differential algebraic set of equations, then we just have a set of differential equations. So here we're using explicitly the expression for PE. Can we do that in a system with 10 machines? No. In that case, we will not be able to find explicit expression for the electrical power. We cannot do this. In this case, it's so simple. Yes, we can replace that there. The idea that later, in, during the semester, we're able to simulate multiple machines. Yeah. So this is the set of differential equations. Now we need to study the dynamics of this. So the first part is to obtain the equilibrium point of the system. So we set the derivative to zero. If we set this to zero, then omega must be equal to one. So at the equilibrium point, the speed will be the nominal speed. And that makes sense. On the other equation, if this, is, this derivative is set to zero, then the mechanical power must be equal to the electrical power. And because this is a sinusoidal function, we have infinite solution. So we can focus here between zero and two pi. So between zero and two pi, if, if this is a generator, this is the power that we're injecting. So this power is positive. So the solution we will get here will be between zero and pi, actually. And that is the case. So from pi to two pi, this expression for the electrical power is going to be negative. So the power is flowing back to the source, which is not what we have. We have a generator. So therefore, we are going to focus here between zero and 180 degrees. So this is the expression for the electrical power. We have a maximum value. As I said, that maximum value can change if the reactants change or the internal voltage in the machine change because we're changing the current in the rotor uh, winding. 
And in red, we have the mechanical power. What is the equilibrium point when these two powers are equal? So we have the intersection of these two curves there and there. So the equilibrium point for this case, delta zero, can be obtained just getting the arc, arc sine of PM over P mass. Basically, we are solving for delta using this equation. Of course, if PM is greater than P mass, then sine of delta will be greater than one, which is not feasible. And in that case, delta will have no solution, right? So we need to have a mechanical power that is always less than P max. So if that is the case, we have PM less than P max, like in this figure, then we should be able to find the solution delta zero. Because of the symmetry, the other solution, this one right here, going to be pi minus delta zero. So these are the two equilibrium points we can study and use to understand how the machine will behave around these two equilibrium points. Dynamic behavior around the first equilibrium point, delta zero. So what do we do here? We get the linearized model. So these are the equations. So the first one, you get, these are nonlinear equations because of sine here. But the first equation, if you get the derivative of this function with respect to delta, you get zero. If you get the derivative with respect to omega, you get omega s. For the second function, which is this power imbalance here divided by 2h, if you get the derivative with respect to delta, then you're going to get negative p max cosine of delta over 2h. That's going to be the derivative with respect to delta. And the derivative with respect to omega is going to be zero. And that's what we have here. So this is the linearized model. And this is going to be evaluated at the first equilibrium point when delta is equal to delta zero. So then when we have this matrix, then we can calculate the eigenvalues. We have these, uh, we need to determine the determinant of this matrix. And we get this uh, quadratic equation. And we solve the quadratic equation, this pass to the other side, and then we take the square root of this. As cosine of delta in that range, what range? From zero to 90 degrees. In this part, cosine of delta here will be positive. From here to here, cosine of delta will be negative. But in this first part, cosine of delta will be positive. So this term will be positive. All of this will be positive. So basically, here you have the square root of a negative number. And therefore, the eigenvalues for this case is going to be a plus minus j some number. It's purely imaginary. So as we studied before, that is the, the description of a center. So if we get very close to that equilibrium point, the system will behave like a center. So this is the situation. We have the electrical power. We have the mechanical power. That's the equilibrium point that we're studying, delta zero. By doing the linearization, we realize that this is a center. So what is the meaning of that? If for some reason, that angle deviates from the equilibrium point, what could be the reason? A fault. If that angle deviates to this point, for example, what will happen? The system will be trapped in a center. So this, the, the angle will reach a maximum value and start oscillating back and forth around that equilibrium point forever. So we have a center. So if we describe that in the phase plane, we have delta and omega, then basically you will have the behavior. This center, the, the trajectory will move uh, clockwise. Why? Because whenever the speed is greater than one, then the changes in delta are going to be positive. That's what we have 
in the model. So whenever omega is greater than one, the derivative of delta in time will be positive. But if omega is less than one, the derivative of the angle will be negative. And by that observation, then we can conclude that this, the trajectory will move in that uh, closed trajectory uh, in a clockwise uh, sense. So that's the behavior. Um, the system will, the machine will oscillate. And this is very similar to the pendulum we studied before. So we have two equilibrium points, one when the angle is zero and the other when the angle is pi. So in zero, when, whenever we didn't consider any damping, the pendulum oscillates between a maximum and minimum angle forever. Never got damped and oscillate. That is exactly what we're getting here a center oscillation, sustained oscillation between a maximum and minimum angle. On the other equilibrium point, which is pi negative delta zero, the linearization is the same. We just replace delta, but pi minus delta zero. This is the other equilibrium point. So by doing that, actually we get the same, same expression, but the sign now are different. Cosine of pi minus delta, which is between 90 and 180 degrees, this is going to be negative. And if this is negative, with that negative, it gets canceled. You just have the square root of a cross positive number. Therefore, you have two real eigenvalues, one positive and one negative. And this is just a subtle note. So in this case, we're studying the behavior of the machine around this equilibrium point. So this is going to be unstable. If we are removed from that equilibrium point, we are going to be pushed away from that equilibrium point. Either the angle will decrease along this curve or increase along this curve. So we can also get the eigenvector in that, uh, for that equilibrium point. And we should get a characteristic that look like this. And as you can see, it's very similar to what we had in the pendulum. So you will have here an equilibrium point that is a center around here with delta zero, and another point here that is a saddle node. So uh, the trajectory in the center moves clockwise, and if that trajectory start growing in amplitude, at some point will be captured by this saddle node. Some trajectory will try to take you close to that a point, but then you will be pushed away from that point. So it will be interesting to see if that center, the amplitude of that center is large enough, large enough that we surpass that IM vector, then what would be the behavior of the system? Will the system still oscillate forever? And what do you think? If we pass the second equilibrium? If we pass, if the amplitude of that center is so large that at some point we cross this eigen vector, we will lose angle stability. We will lose angle stability because then that trajectory will be pushed to infinity. We will see that. We will simulate this and verify that state. Example B, the same system, but let's add some damping. In any system, how you're going to get damping? Well, we need a better model for the synchronous generator. And as I described at the beginning, the machine is designed with dampers. These are windings that are intentionally placed in the machine in short circuit. So there is no active source applied to this winding. So any change, any disturbance the machine may have will induce current in this damper and those currents will create a torque that will help to stabilize the machine. We will add damping. Uh, so that's one way to do it. We need to have a better model. And the other one, we need to add some losses in the system. Losses also will create some damping because the change of energy will not be perfect. You will be losing energy and that will in, in, uh, add some damping to the system. Because we don't wanna make this, this system complex yet, we will get there, but 
we don't want to do it yet. We're going to use an artificial model for the damping. And that is through this power term, damping power. So this is going to be another force applied to the shaft. You remember we consider this in the second problem of the first homework. You have a block, you have a spring, and you have a damper. The force is in the damper is proportional to the speed in that block. Because this is a synchronous machine, this is not proportional to the speed, but to the delta speed, because these will always oscillate around one. So the power, the damping power here is some gain multiplied by delta omega. Typically, because this is just a simple way to a damping and uh, probably it's hard to justify this model, but we are adding that to, to include some damping in this model. Uh, typically, we will assume that KV is two times H. That's a, a typical value for KV. Because this power is in per unit, the speed is in per unit, KV will be in per unit. So whatever H we have, let's say 10 seconds, then KV will be 10 per unit. By adding the damping, then we need to add that force power in this case right here in the second equation. So now the power balance will include the mechanical power minus the electrical power and minus the damping power. We repeat the analysis. Now that we have added damping, how the dynamic will change. The first thing we need to do is to calculate the equilibrium force. So we set the derivative to zero. This doesn't change. The, at the equilibrium point, the speed needs to be the nominal speed. Now, we set the derivative of the speed to zero. But because omega is equal to one, this term gets canceled. And the equilibrium point is still defined by making the mechanical power equal to the electrical power. Therefore, the equilibrium point doesn't change when we add damping. Now we repeat the process. We have two equilibrium points, exactly the same as the one we got without damping. We linearize the system, but now the linearization is different. This term before was zero. Now we have a coefficient that depends on the damping. So in this case, it's negative KV over 2H. By adding the term now, we can calculate the eigenvalues, and now this is modified. Before here, we have lambda. Now you have this term that add this linear term in the quadratic equation. Now we need to get the solution for the quadratic equation and solve for lambda. So this is going to be minus b, this coefficient here, divided by 2a, a is one. So you have this first term plus minus, 1 over 2a, which is 2, the square root of b squared, this one, minus 4 times a, which is 1, c, which is this term. And then we see what happened. So cosine of delta 0, because this is the first equilibrium point, we're between 0 and 90 degrees. This is going to be positive. And then you will have a term here, second term, that is going to be negative. We said that KD will be 2H most of the time. So here you have one square one. And here on this side, what do you have? Well, depending on the angle of delta, you will have, let's assume that you have an, an, an angle that is, that is going to be small enough. So this cosine of delta zero will be some number close to one. And then you have P max over 2H. But what do you have here? The angular speed, how much is this term? About 377 radians per second. And here you have one. So what you're going to get most of the time is that this term will be negative. And because it's negative, then you have a complex solution. In this case, because we're adding damping, you will have a real component. And that real component will be negative. So 
what we're going to have in that first equilibrium point is not a center anymore, but a stable focus. For the second equilibrium point now, pi minus delta zero, we repeat the same linearization, but delta is evaluated in pi minus delta zero. We repeat the process, we get the eigenvalues, but now this term, because this is between 90 and 180 degrees, this term is negative. If this is negative, with that become positive, and then you have the square root of a positive real number, and therefore here you have two real solution, what is positive and the other is negative. Therefore, you have a subtle node. So by adding the, the damping, this term doesn't change. This remain being a subtle node, but this one now changed from a center to a stable focus. Okay, any question? So, so uh, I get that the uh, new uh, square root term is now uh, a real number, but since we now have a, co a negative real number out in the front to the left, could we then, uh, perhaps if we had a very large KD, uh, oh, wait, oh, no, never mind. The right half would always be larger, so one of them would always be positive. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So these, whatever we get, always will be larger than this. So when you have the negative, you will have the negative real ion bus. And when this is positive, it will become positive. So it's a subtle no. Good observation. Now let's uh, let's let's put some numbers and see what we get. And I'm going to try to simulate this and see what we get. Uh, the system is the same, but we have an inertia of five seconds. The synchronous reactant is 0 0.2 per unit. The generated power is 0 0.5 per unit. Because we don't have any loss in the system, the generated power need to be equal to the mechanical power that we apply in the shaft. So basically, that's the data we're getting, the mechanical power. The internal voltage is going to be 5% above the nominal value. And the infinite bus for simplicity is going to be one angle zero. The line will have a reactance of 0 0.3 per unit. So with this number, then we can get the maximum power, which is EV over the total reactance in this system. So the maximum power is going to be 2.1 per unit. Yeah, so that's the maximum power. The machine is generating 0.5 per unit. So we're far away from, from that maximum power. We're fine. We should have equilibrium point in this system. For KV, we're going to assume that this is 2H. As H is five seconds, then KV is 10 per unit. And finally, this is the set of equation we need to consider. The derivative of the angle is going to be this. This omega S is roughly three, 177 radians per second. And this is the derivative of the speed. This is the accelerating power. So if this is positive, we'll make the machine to speed up divided by 2H. So we put the numbers for PM, which is 0, 0.5, divided by 2H, which is 10, and we'll give you this. P max, which is 2.1 divided by 10, it will give you this. And KV, which is 2H divided by 2H, will give you one here. So this is the equation we will use for this system. We calculate the equilibrium point. So delta zero will be the arc sine of PM over P max, 0, 0.5 over 2.1. And that's a value in radians. So the first equilibrium point will be delta zero and one. This is one equilibrium point. The second one will be similar, but delta will be pi minus delta zero, which is a little bit more than 2.9 radians. So these are the two equilibrium points. We verify what we get at this two equilibrium point. We have the linearized model using damping. We replace the numbers, and that's the matrix A we get. We 
get the eigenvalues, you can get the quadratic equation. And you have the complex eigenvalue. The real part is negative. Therefore, we have a stable focus. For the second equilibrium point, same situation, but the angle now is the angle of the second equilibrium point, which is pi minus delta zero. The only difference here, before we had negative here, now is positive. So these numbers change the sign. And by just that, um, this is a quadratic equation, and this is a solution in which you have one positive and one negative real eigenvalue. This is a subtle node. Okay? That's, that's the example. Now, what do, you do, do I want to do with you now that we have this solution? We have a, a generator connected through a line in an infinite bus. The generator is generating 0 0.5 per unit of power, and we have two equilibrium points. What I want to do with you is to simulate the behavior of the machine and see what we get. All right, um, probably this is going to be too small. You, oh darn, I need to bring my glasses next time. Preference here and font here. Font. The other number, let's say 24, apply. All right, that's a good size. Okay, so what we're going to do here, we're going to define, um, oops. There. There. Yeah. We're going to define the parameters of the system. So H is going to be phi second. Uh, we have the internal voltage, which is phi percent over the nominal one. The reactance of the machine is 0 0.2. The reactance of the line is 0 0.3. And the mechanical power is 0 0.5. So that's the data we have. And we can, we can get the, um, the equilibrium point. Equilibrium point will be delta zero. It's going to be the arc, arc sine of PM over P max. So we need to calculate here the maximum power we can send through this system. And that is given by EO multiplied by B divided by the total reactance. So I am missing the voltage at the infinite bus has an angle zero and the voltage is one per unit. So that will give us the angle delta, delta zero equilibrium point. Um, so to make it simple here, we're going to use a solver from MATLAB. Because the system has just two differential equations, we can use OD45. And we will specify here the parameters we need. If you don't know what to do with the OD45, you just type help OD45. And then you should have some uh, explanation of what to do. So what we're going to do here, basically, we're going to call this function. It's going to give you the time of the simulation, 
and it's going to give you the solution of the state variable. You will invoke the solver, but you need to give the differential equations right here, the time of simulation, T span, and the initial condition, whatever it is. To start with, we're going to assume that the initial condition is the equilibrium point. So when we simulate this, what you're going to expect? The system is at the equilibrium point. What would be the solution? A straight line, nothing changed. So that's what we need to get first. So how much time we're going to simulate? Let's simulate 10 seconds and, and, and we will see, we can change this later. So now we call the solver. The state variable is going to be X1 is going to be delta, X2 is going to be omega. So X is going to be a vector, two terms, OD45. So as we have it right here, then we need to put the function. One way to do this is using the handle function. We will put this function at the bottom of the code. Also, you can put this function as a M file. You can put the function aside in a different file. When you have a large system, maybe that would be more convenient. So we have that, and then we specify the time of simulation, which we define it here. And then we specify the initial condition. So the initial condition here is going to be x0 is going to be delta 0. And the x2, which is the speed, which is going to be one per unit. So that's it. Um, then when we have the solution, we can do some plotting and we can have in figure one, we can have um, a subplot. So we will have two plot in the same figure. And here we will plot the speed of the delta. Let's, let's plot delta here. And then in the other plot, which is going to be at the bottom, it's going to be the speed. The data here, the solver will give you the data in a matrix. The first column is going to be the first state variable and the second column, the second one. That's why I am plotting here the second column. So all the rows in the system, that's why I put that, and second column, and I will plot T with respect to that. And this is going to be in blue. Uh, we can put some label here. Um, the first plot is the angle so we can put that here. This is going to be a text. So we put that apostrophe. It's going to be delta. And this is going to be in radians. So that's one. Then for this one, the Y label is going to be a speed omega. And that's going to be in per unit. And at the bottom of these, we can put the label for time. So those are the plot. Then we can have a second plot, which is going to be in the face plane. So here we can plot the angle delta with respect to the speed. We will have that plot in the face plane. As I said before, we have the code already. That's all that we need but uh, we need to define this function f. As I said, you can create a separate file, m file with that name, f, or you can define that at the bottom of this code. And that's what I'm going to do. The output of this function, uh, you can name anything. I will put out, or we can put dx dt. We know that this is the derivative, and that's going to be the function. When you use that handle in this solver, this function will have the same variables that you're getting out. So these will require the variable time, t, and the 
the state variable x. So we need to include that here. For this case, uh, basically, we're going to just get the data um, and copy this because each time the solver will invoke this function, we need to get the data. And because you have two, two state variables, two differential equations, dx dt will be a vector of two terms. Yeah. So David asked, well, how do we include nonlinear function? Well, this is the way to do it. it can be linear, it can be nonlinear, anything. All we have to do here is to put whatever function we have for each term. Another parameter we need here is omega s, which is 120 pi. Yeah. So the derivative of the angle in time is omega s multiplied by omega minus one. But what is omega? Another thing we need to do here, read the variables. When you are in that function here, it will read receive as an input, what is the state variable? It's going to be the vector x. So we need to read that. The first component of the vector x is going to be delta. So delta is going to be x1. And omega, which is the speed, is going to be the second component. And here we will continue. Now, when we have the derivative of the angle in time, is going to be omega s, omega, the one that we are reading there, there, minus one. The second derivative, second row, first column, is going to be the equation we use. So this is going to be the accelerating power here divided by two times h. On this side, then we have the mechanical power minus the electrical power, which is P max sine of delta. And then we have KV. We need to put it right here. KV is going to be, we're assuming that it's going to be two times H. So here we will put the damping power. So it's going to be KV multiplied by omega minus one. And that's it. We have added the, the function and we put it there as a sub function of our main code. And each time the code reach to line 15, the solver OD45 will be invoked and the solver will call as many times as needed the function f that is at the bottom. Yeah. Can we simulate anything different? Yes, just change the differential equation here. Now let's cross finger. Let's see if this works. Editor, editor, here we go. Whenever my computer is ready. There it is. Darn it, it didn't do anything. Why? Because we're simulating the system at the equilibrium point. So in the phase plane, we cannot see it here. It's just a point. But in this case, which is the variable but with respect to time, it's constant. We're at the equilibrium point. Yeah. So now, what can we do? We're trying to understand how the system will behave when we perturb the system. What can create this A short circuit typically? So we will consider soon uh, what do we need to do if we have a short circuit in the system. For this moment, we're going to just apply any disturbance from that equilibrium point and see what we get. So if this is the initial condition for the simulation. We will not start from that equilibrium point, but we will move it 
0 0.1 radians and see what we get. Okay. So we close all the figures, we run it again, and that's what we get. And that's exactly what we got before. The system that now will start from delta zero plus 0 0.1 right here will oscillate with that, some damping because we include damping and we will con convert to the equilibrium form. The angle will do that, but also the speed will do the same. In the phase plane, this is what we have. We started from here, but as you can see, this is a spiral that converged to the equilibrium point because we have a stable focus. This behavior is very similar to what we have in the pendulum. In the pendulum, the equilibrium point always is zero, but in this case, the equilibrium point will be delta zero. What happens if we increase? Yes. Why doesn't it show like the pi minus? Because we started the system from that equilibrium point. We, we are, Even though you, I perturb it, but they perturb it 0 0.1, a tiny magnitude. We are still in that area. And that the trajectory in the system is attracted by the stable focus. Now, if I disturb the system even more, it's not zero one. We put a large number, we can see what happened. Uh, what was the, the other equilibrium point? 2.9, something like that. Uh, what about if I put here two radians from that delta zero, but we push it two radians. Uh, close. Close all, we write it again. Oop, we're still fine. <laughs> it's a very robust system. Uh, the trajectory here is not very uniform. It's kind of distort distorted a little bit. Can you see it? Do you see what is happening here or not? What is happening? What are you getting? Uh, yeah, and the other one is a subtle note. So we are getting very close to the diagonal vector of the subtle node. Still, we're fine. Why? Because I put it over there. What about if I add also speed? This, the subtle node will be somewhere here. But if I add the speed of the initial condition, I might be above that diagonal vector. I don't know if that will make any difference. So the equilibrium point here, how much? I don't know how much, 0 0.1. All right, the system become unstable. So we will get there. What we're going to do, we're going to make the connection of everything that we study, linear system and nonlinear system and apply it to this machine, okay? This has to do with some limit. We, the system can, we stand some disturbance, but if the disturbance is large enough, the system might lose stability, uh, like as you can see in the plot. Okay, so we will take it from here next uh, class. Bring your computer if you want to play with MATLAB with me. We can do that on Monday. Any question? A couple of questions. Um, it wasn't really anything in this lecture, but last lecture. So. Um, <clears throat> You mentioned that for like small disturbances, the governor of the generator will maybe increase the, the steam flow through the turbine and create a little more power or maybe a little less power. Um, that's for small disturbances. How is the generator controlled for like, for example, if we need to increase a lot of power to meet the like a peak demand time, like we're coming out of the nighttime in the morning and we need to like, the system is going to be demanding a lot more power in the, in the next hour. Um, and, you know, obviously at a real generator, it takes time to bring up the, the actual mechanical power. So how is that planned for? You know, for example, 5 a.m., no one's using power, but at 7 a.m., everyone's going to be using power. So we need to increase the generator output all at once. There is a concept that is called a spin reserve. 
The spinning reserve is the ability of the generator to increase our power. So given an operating point, we need to know how much is the spinning reserve, how much without doing anything, the generator can increase uh, the power in, in an acceptable time. If uh, we're going to expect that the system might have an increase in demand, then what we need to do is to commit more generators to be connected and operational at that moment. In that fashion, we will have enough power to cover any spike in the demand. And then you have generators on standby during the Yeah, the, the, you have those definitions, a spin reserve, or you have a standby generator that is maybe not connected to the grid, but are running uh, without any load and ready to be connected and be dispatched. Another thing we can do, we can have fast generators, generators that can be connected and provide power immediately. Not immediately, but soon. Gas turbines can do that. You know? Diesel generators can do that. A whole thermal power plant? No. <laughs> they will need hours to get ready. Because the time that for them to be ready is so long, then we need to schedule and, and decide if the system will have a spike in the demand. Maybe we can prepare the thermal power plant and be operational at the moment so they can take some load if the system needs it. That's an aspect uh, that is a study in economics of power system. We want to mean, of course, having a generator standby or committed to the system will increase the cost, and we want to minimize the cost. How we can minimize the cost, but without putting the system in risk of not being able to follow the demand? Yes, that, that's the question. Yeah. Thank you, guys.